The betrayal and fights for Nigeria's oil revenue. The Kentaro Wiwa story. When General Chukwembeka Ujuku declared the independence of the Biafran Republic in May 1967, not many could have quite predicted the level of carnage and devastation that would befall the people of Southeast Nigeria over the course of the next three years. Hello, explorers. Welcome to the channel and to another interesting video. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new updates. Back to our video. Having concluded that their people were no longer safe anywhere within the borders of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the political leaders of the Igbo ethnic group decided that the only way to save their people from ethnic persecution was to break away and form their own country. Buried deep underneath the Biafran tour was one of Africa's largest reserves of crude oil and emboldened by the seemingly infinite money making potential for the precious black toxin, Biafran's new leaders charged forward in full confidence that very ground they walked on was their golden ticket to becoming an African powerhouse. But just as it felt the Biafran fight for secession, the region's vast deposits of black gold also enforced the Nigerian government's resolve to extinguish the Biafran uprising by any means necessary. With the newly independent state attempting to take away an estimated 67% of Nigeria's oil reserves, the stage had been set for what would ultimately go down as the most violent conflict in West African history. For three grueling years, the Nigerian and Biafran armies would engage in a raging battle for dominance in which an estimated 2 million civilians would lose their lives due to starvation and disease. But as with virtually all modern conflicts, the battle would be much more than just the violent exchange of bullets and explosives. The Nigerian civil war would see both belligerents engage in wartime propaganda with a level of sophistication never before seen on Afghan soil. According to the Nigerians, the Biafran state was nothing more than a rogue intervention sponsored by nefarious foreign powers seeking to destabilize and disintegrate a promising African country. The Biafran narrative, on the other hand, invoked a much more visceral reaction. Their message to the international community was that the Nigerian state had adopted the policy of ethnic cleansing against the Igbo people and so Biafran independence was the only way to protect themselves from complete annihilation by a Nigerian state whose only interest was in the exploitation of their precious oil reserves. But if the general rule is that history is written by the victors, then the Nigerian civil war might just be the exception. Although the war ultimately ended with the victory for the Nigerian army, the Biafran wartime message would have a long-lasting impact on how Nigerians' oil wealth would come to be viewed in the years following the war. You see, one of the interesting paradoxes of the Biafran struggle was that in breaking away from Nigeria, the Igbo leaders also took with them a significant number of minority ethnic groups native to southeast Nigeria. And although many international observers ultimately came to associate Nigeria's oil with the Igbo struggle for independence, their true heirs of Nigeria's oil wealth in the strictest sense were the various minority ethnic groups of the Niger Delta region. When added together, these groups amounted to as high as an estimated 40% of the wartime Biafran population, and although many of them would remain relatively unknown both during and after the war, they would be arguably the worst affected victims of the never-ending struggle for Nigerian oil. As with most Nigerian ethnic minorities, the end of the civil war in 1970 hardly changed their fortunes. In fact, post-war Nigeria would be not so much divided by ethnicity as it was by the halves and the halves not. With various military dictators taking turns at the helm of power and oil prices flying sky high, Nigeria in the 70s, 80s and 90s became a perfect illustration of what political scientists would refer to as a rentier state, a country which was solely dependent on bribes, rents and taxes paid by foreign businesses in exchange for raw natural resources. With the oil money in full flow, Nigeria's leaders really didn't need the economy as a whole to perform in order to fill their pockets. Even better, they didn't need to rely on the approval of any electoral either. Aside from a very brief period of democracy under President Shegu Shagari, between 1979 and 1983, Nigeria would remain under the firm grip of a host of brutal dictators. From the end of the civil war right up onto the creation of a fourth Nigerian Republic in May 1999, the post-war Nigerian state basically had absolutely no civic contract with the Nigerian people and so the only relationship that truly mattered to Nigeria's leaders were their numerous opaque agreements with the multinational oil companies operating within the country's oil sector. Of all the casualties of this unholy post-war alliance between the Nigerian military state and big oil, the Ogoni people were arguably amongst the worst hit. With the full blessing of the Nigerian government, the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Company was authorized to exploit and extract oil from Ogoni land. 
while this was a win-win deal for Nigeria's military generals and the oil giants, Shell's entry into the region quickly became nothing short of a living nightmare for the Ogoni people. In a strongly worded letter sent to Shell's headquarters in the city of Port Harcourt, just three months after the end of the civil war, a group of Ogoni leaders and representatives raised content about the serious damage being done to their land by Shell. According to the letter, the Ogoni roadways had begun collapsing under the sheer weight of Shell's machinery and the fishing farming industries which had been part and parcel of the Ogoni way of life for centuries were now under the significant threat from oil spills on their farmlands and waterways. Responding to the allegations levied against them, Shell BP swiftly dismissed the Ogoni's claims as nothing more than a dishonest attempt to blackmail them into paying money to the Ogoni leadership and forcing Shell into building free local infrastructure. But just two weeks after Shell BP sent his response, a catastrophic incident occurred in the heart of Ogoni land. On the 19th July 1970, an oil wellhead exploded, hurling fire and hot oil into the skies. Within a short period of time, the Ogoni's main sources of drinking water were completely poisoned. Farmers began staying away from their own farms for fear of igniting fires. And those who were brave enough to return found themselves waddling knee deep in crude oil. For three long weeks, the oil spilled continued unabated, contaminating everything it came into contact with, from the Ogoni's air to their land and their waterways. Unfortunately, the July 1970 oil spill would be just one of amongst a long list of similarly devastating incidents that would occur over the course of the next three decades. In fact, by the end of the 1990s, the total amount of crude oil spilled on Ogoni land would reportedly reach as high as a combined total of 2.5 million barrels. Monitoring the oil spills from his offices in the city of Port Harcourt was the renowned Ogoni writer and film producer Ken Sarowiwa. After a short career in government, Sarowiwa had a reason to become arguably the most well-known Ogoni in all of Nigeria thanks to the success of his hit comedy Shobasi and Company. Centered on the life and trials of a small-time conman named Mr. B and his various get-rich-quick schemes, the popularity of Sarowiwa's comedy show was largely due to its light-hearted critique of the get-rich-quick mindset that was prevalent at every level of Nigerian society. Having grown sick and tired of the military government's complexity and the devastation of his ancestral land, Sarowiwa spearheaded the creation of a pressure group known as the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, popularly known as Moso. With the approval of the elders and traditional rulers of the Goni communities, Ken Sarowiwa drew up a bill of rights and mandating greater financing and political autonomy for the Goni people. Sarowiwa then sent out his bill of rights to the military government alongside an urgent call for protection against Shell's devastation for their land and property. But with Sarowiwa's most of group having virtually no real bargaining power, the Nigerian government's response was to simply try to brush Sarowiwa aside and carry on with business as usual. Deciding that more drastic measures needed to be taken, Sarowiwa organized a mass protest on the 3rd of January 1993 in which he mobilized an estimated one-third of the entire Ogoni population to come out in peaceful protest against Shell's exploitation and the Nigerian government's betrayal of Ogoni land. Although this protest in 1993 did raise a lot and awareness about the plight of the Ogoni people, the demonstrations would have no immediate impact on the Shell's oppressions. There you have it for this episode of the video. If you're interested and want us to continue this amazing story, make sure to leave a comment and don't forget to share with a friend.